Here I have two cylinders. On the left side is a PVC pipe, which is rigorously manufactured to be approximately perfectly cylindrical. And on the right side, I have a tree branch that I had cut into a cylinder-like shape. What we're gonna try to do is measure the diameter and the circumferences of these cylinders. So you'll need a ruler or other measurement device. You'll want to line up one side of the cylinder so that it's touching a hatch mark of the ruler. And then try to get your estimate of the diameter, which is the largest distance across the cylinder here. So this measurement might be something like 2.61 measure it multiple different ways like that and then just do the same for the wood measure its diameter multiple times when we're finding the circumference of the cylinders we want to put a dark mark on an edge of the cylinder then set it down on a piece of paper You'll want to make a line on your paper to indicate where the mark touches the paper. Then roll your cylinder until that mark comes back and touches the paper once again. We'll make a final line on the paper. And now we just have to measure the distance between those marks. And that's going to be an estimate of the circumference of our cylinder. So this one would be about 8.49, maybe 8.50. We don't want to do it just once, though. We want to repeat this process multiple times because there is expected to be error in this type of measurement for sure. There was error in the diameter measurement as well, but in this case we expect there to be quite a bit more error because of slipping of the cylinder and things like that. It's also possible that the cylinders aren't manufactured to be exactly perfect cylinders. What we're looking to do is we want to put the ruler across the widest part of the circle. Okay, that in geometry of course would be called the diameter. So we're gonna measure it uh, once but in science, we don't measure things just once. Okay, we like to measure them multiple times to see if our results are reproducible. So what you wanna do then is reorient your ruler so that you get just a different look at the diameter of the thing. And then we could call this measurement perhaps D2. And then measure it again. Wanna make multiple measurements. This could be D3. We'll do the same thing for the wood. Okay, so this is a very nicely shaped PVC pipe on the left. And this is just a branch of wood that I cut. Uh, somewhat circular, but not as perfect. So which object do you think is going to have more variation? <laughs> yeah, the wood, okay. Yeah, so make six measurements on each object and then record them in your data table that's what the spaces here are for so you could put you know your d1 here for the pvc and then d2 could go here and d3 so i have some sample data actually that i uh, measured so here was uh, my results i got 2.67 centimeters then I did it again, and believe it or not, I had 2.68 centimeters. 
With the PVC, I found very little variation when I did the measurements. Also notice the number of digits that I'm giving. I'm giving three significant figures. I'm taking uh, it out to the hundredth place, the second decimal place. Now, in science, the number of digits you give depends on the precision of the instrument that you're working with. Yeah, the ruler itself looked like this, where this was one centimeter. This was two centimeters. And the three centimeters was way off the object. Now, on my ruler, it's not marked to just the centimeter. It's actually marked to the tenth of a centimeter. Okay, so what we have is we have 10 subdivisions of the centimeter. Now, as the person making the measurement, you are expected to guess one digit beyond what the ruler is even marked to, uh, trying to make the right measurement for the right instrument. So here we are marked to the 10th. So we are justified in estimating to the hundredth. Because you're making an estimate, you're not sure which hundredth is the right hundredth to give. It's really just a guess. So when I look at the edge of the red there, I might say this is something like, you know, perhaps 2.6 so if it was right on the the sixth hatch mark 2.6 then I would say 2.60 if it was right on the next hatch mark of 2.7 I would say like 2.70 I'm saying that it's about halfway between so I guessed this hundredth digit so as I'm walking around and you're doing this lab I want to see that you have given the right number of digits. Okay, so I'll just check that as you're working. Um, yeah, so now we have that. We also have to find what's called now a best estimate. So the best estimate here is found by averaging all your individual measurements. So we want to get an average of this column. To do that, we'll use an online calculator. Let me pull up the web here. You just do a Google search for standard deviation calculator. I usually use the first one that comes up, this one right here. And you can put all your measurements into a comma separated list now. You'll want to select sample because there are many more measurements that you could make. We just took a handful of them and we're going to use that as what's called a sample in statistics. So click that. Okay, so it's going to give you a few things. It's going to give you a mean, which is called X bar. That's going to be your best estimate. It's the average of the six. And it's also going to give you a thing called the standard deviation, which is a measure of how varied your measurements are. In my case, for this PVC, there was not a whole lot of variety. They were very similar. So we see a very small standard deviation in that case. I'll transfer this over to my paper. So my mean is 2.68. 167 you can keep more digits than you need for this row here your uncertainty is going to be the standard deviation which was the s value and that was 0 0.00753 then you want to give your final result for that measurement so the way we do that is we're going to say it's going to be the best estimate plus or minus the standard deviation so uh, let's write 2.682 plus or minus 0 0.008. Now let's talk about why I chose those number of digits as opposed to some other choice. 
So your uncertainty should be rounded to just one sig fig in most cases. You could do two in some cases, and that would be reasonable, but never more than two generally. Okay, so because my most important digit here for the standard deviation was in the thousandth place, I actually used his friend next to him, the 5, to round my 7 up to an 8. And that's all I gave as my uncertainty. I'm just using the most important digit. And then also, I wanted to round my best estimate to the same place value that my uncertainty is in. So see, the uncertainty is in the third decimal place, the thousandth. So that's the digit that I'm not sure about, the thousandth digit. And then you want to round this guy also to the thousandth. That's a general principle to try and follow. Okay, so that was for PVC. I also did an example of the wood. Okay, so when I did the wood, here were my results. 2.00. 2.32 keep in mind that I do have to state those zeros like that okay you want to give that hundredth place to convey to a reader who knows science the type of instrument that you had and how confident you are in the digits when somebody reads this who knows science they know that your instrument was marked to the tenth and you guessed the hundredth if I didn't have those digits there they wouldn't think that I had any confidence in those digits. Okay, so it's different from math, where in math, like, 2 is the same as 2.00. In science and engineering, it's not. All right, now my average was 2.125. And look at the variation that I got. In this case, some of the tenths were different, you know? Here I had the same tenth every time. That's because the wood was just a little bit more non-uniform. My standard deviation came out to 0.134 for this data. So the uncertainty is more than 10 times larger for the wood versus the PVC. Now when I give my final answer, you gotta round that uncertainty to the most significant digit. 0 0.1 and if you're rounding him to the tenth place you're also going to round your best estimate to the tenth place as well so the answer for this one would be 2.1 plus or minus 0.1 saying that I'm not sure about the tenth digit and it could be as small as 2.0 or perhaps as large as 2.2 okay we can also draw confidence intervals for our measurements. So the way we draw a confidence interval is you make a little number line like this. You put your best estimate as a dot in the middle. So it's going to be for the PVC 2.6 8, 2 goes in the middle. Then you put some parentheses on the right and some parentheses on the left. This is for diameter of PVC. Now, when you do the right side of it, what you do is you add that standard deviation. I'm going to give it the symbol sigma with a little subscript of D. Uh, what that means is that's supposed to stand for the uncertainty in the diameter, which is going to be this number right here. So what we want is we want 2.682 plus 0.008. Okay, then on the left side we do 2.682 minus 0 0.008. So let me just calculate those real quick. We have 
and 2.674. And so now what we can report is that we believe that the diameter is somewhere between 2.674 and 2.690. That's how you make a confidence interval. Now what exactly is this standard deviation? It's like an average of how different the answers are. Basically you can see that the thing is usually off by about a hundredth. Okay, or maybe even a little less than a hundredth the digits are off by. That's what that's supposed to represent, is how off they tend to be. With this guy though, your wood, they're off by like at least a tenth of each other. Could be like maybe one or two tenths difference in all the measurements. And so that's what this is supposed to show here. All right, that's my introduction. You got any questions about it so far? Okay, uh, so I'll take you to the next step of what you gotta do next. Next you have to do the same thing, but with the circumference of your object. This is a little bit harder to measure. We can't just directly measure circumference of a circular thing. So we have this uh, creative approach here. What you got to do is put your cylinder down on uh, paper and I'll show you on the document cam. Alright, so your cylinder is going to have some marks on it. What you got to do is go to your paper and see that there's a mark on the cylinder. Put it down on the paper and then put a mark on your paper. Then you want to roll the thing all the way until that mark comes back and then it's touching the paper again. Okay, then what we'll do is we'll use a ruler to measure the distance between the markings. Now of course, you don't want to do it just once. The lab asks you to do it six times. Okay, so just Mark it, again, roll it, make another ending mark, and then just measure. Uh, that'll give you six circumferences to work with. I'll write down what uh, mine were, 8.42. Which process do you think has more error in it? <laughs> yeah, this one for sure, because the thing can slip. It also might not be totally you know, round. There could be defects in the manufacturing. Okay, so I got these results. Um, so I got this 8.45 plus or minus 0.07. Now, the symbols that we want to use with these, this guy can be called D, and then this will be plus or minus what I'll call sigma D. So, D, uh, we could put a little subscript of best. This is called just sigma D. Down here we'll call this the best circumference. And then this will be sigma C. Because it's gonna give you some formulas to plug into. First formula is simply dividing your best circumference by your best diameter for each object. So this could be for the PVC. I'll do um, 8.45, which is the best circumference, divided by 2.682, which is the best diameter. Okay, so I get 3.15. One. What do you think it's supposed to be? <laughs> Special number of math that we're looking for here. Yeah, you're right. It's supposed to be pi, ideally. Because of the formula C equals pi times D, if you were to divide the D to the other side, you would actually get that the ratio of C over D is in math supposed to be pi. That's what we're looking for in this lab. Now, when you have a calculation where you're dividing two numbers, two quantities from science, 
you got to use rules for significant figures. This is one of our you know, upcoming assignment topics. When you divide something that has three sig figs by something that has four sig figs, how many sig figs do you get to keep? Yeah, you're limited in whichever quantity has the smaller number of sig figs. That's how many sig figs you should keep in your final answer. So I'll make it 3.15 then. Now it's going to ask you now to do what's called propagating the uncertainty. This is a good skill to have for any lab where you make some measurements, you're not sure exactly what the circumference is, you're not sure exactly what the diameter is, and you want to do a calculation, and you want to say how off your calculation using those measurements might be. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to think of the best and worst case scenarios. Now worst case scenario would be, what if you took that 8.45 circumference and let's say it was off by as much as 0.07. So I'm saying, you know, you got 8.45 as your best estimate, but it could be off by as much as 0.07. We want to add that on top to get the biggest possible circumference that there might be. Then for the denominator, we will actually subtract, in this case, his uncertainty. Uh, the reason why this is done with a fraction is because you want the largest numerator and the smallest possible denominator because that'll give you the largest result of your calculation. I'm calling it R largest in the lab. R stands for result of the calculation. All right, so it could be 8.52 divided by 2.674. Let's see what that ends up being. 3.186. So maybe it's not 3.15. Maybe it's as big as 3.186. And then we'll also find the smallest result. To get the smallest result, you want the smallest numerator divided by the largest possible denominator. 8.38 over 2.690. 3.115. So what you get here is you get a range. And we want to put that into a confidence interval. That's the last step of this uh, part of the lab. You do it for each object. Or maybe I'll do it on the next page. It has actual number lines for you to plot your objects. So for the PVC, my interval came out to 3.15, put a dot right there. It could have extended as high as 3.186. So that's like here. And it could have been as low as 3.115. Should be approximately symmetrical this interval and then you just shade it in and that represents your confidence interval for pi this is of course an experimental result it would be called in science but there is also a theoretical answer that we're looking for and that's pi and I'm just going to put it in as a star. Pi, of course, is the theoretical value from math. And it would be at 3.14. Yeah, right here, 14159, yeah. So put a little star there. And what we hope is that the theoretical value is within your confidence interval. That would be a good result. Now, is it possible that it might not be in the interval? 
certainly is, especially if you're dealing with something that's not truly a cylinder. All right, any questions about that part of the lab? Okay, I'll just briefly show you the second part and then I'll let you uh, take your data. So, the second part asks you to pair diameters of objects with their circumferences. You don't have to do any new measurements for this part. You actually just have to transfer your old measurements to this table. Okay, so each row is going to represent an object. So you could put, let's say, your PVC here at the top and then put your wood on the second row. So when it came to the diameter of the PVC, it was 2.682 plus or minus 0 0.008. You just take that value from your earlier data table. It's just this value right here. Okay, then you go and find his circumference as well, 8.45 plus or minus 0 0.07, and put that next to him. Okay, then you want to put your results that you just found using your confidence interval. So for this particular case, it ended up being 3.15 plus or minus 0.04 is what I got. Now, how did I get that 0.04? All you have to do is take your, your largest value for R and subtract your best value to see how wide the confidence interval is. Uh, the distance from the center point to the edge of the confidence interval will be called sigma r, which is your uncertainty in the result. Okay, so if we just take that 3.186 and subtract this minus this. That's how we can get a good estimate of the uncertainty. So, point zero three six. So our final answer there would be three point one five plus or minus point oh four. That's where I got the point oh four from. Another method would be to do largest minus smallest and divide by two. So I'm saying. If you were to take this value, subtract the other end, and then cut it in half, that's another way to do it. Well, largest minus best, or largest minus smallest, divide by two. The wood was 2.1 plus or minus 0.1, 7.02 plus or minus 0.09. Best estimate was 3.34 for the wood. As you can see, it's quite a bit different from pi. And then the uncertainty is going to be about 0.2. Yeah. Now you're going to have four of these, four different objects. So now you want to go to an app called Desmos. In Desmos.com you'll want to click plus in the upper left and add a table to it. Put your diameters on the left and circumferences on the right, just like they appear in the table on the page actually. And you'll have two more. But what it's going to do is it's going to create a scatter plot of your data. And we want to now do what's called linear regression on the data. So to do linear regression, you go to a new field, and you have to type in this command into Desmos, y1 tilde mx1 plus b. And what it's going to do is it's going to find the statistical best fit line between your data points. Uh, yeah, that's what you need to do. At the bottom, it's going to give you a M value, which is the slope, and a B value, which is your intercept. So just transfer those to your paper. I get 
I'll make it 2.46 and then my intercept was 1.86. We're hoping that the intercept comes out close to zero. In my case, uh, I used the wood, which is probably not a great cylinder, so it's not surprising that it's a little off. But what we're looking for is we're hoping that your slope will be pi. Now, uh, pi is the theoretical. This is going to be the experimental from all your trials. Okay, now what you want to do is find a formula for circumference. It's going to come in the form of a line. You all know the formula y equals mx plus b. This is just applying the letters c and d instead of y and x. Okay, so put your m value in. In my case, it was 2.45 and then add your intercept as well and then this is your experimental formula for circumference based on diameter finally we'll do uh, something called finding a percent error and there's a formula for it right here all we have to do is subtract our experimental value of 2.45 minus your uh, theoretical value which is pi and then divide by pi. With this type of formula, we'll want to turn it into a percent by multiplying by 100. And then also, it is common in experiments to just to not really care about whether your value is above or below the accepted value. Um, so a lot of times you'll see absolute value signs around it. But yeah, let's do that calculation right now and see what my percent error is. I have 22% error. Alright, that is my explanation of the lab. I think that concludes it. Um, do you have any questions for me?